Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy podcast. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a newer, stronger foundation essential in creating your meaningful legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. As much as you like this podcast, I'm certain that you're going to love the book that I just released on Amazon, Fuel Your Legacy, The Nine Pillars to Build a Meaningful Legacy. I wrote this to share with you the experiences that I had while I was identifying my identity, how I began to create my meaningful legacy and how you can create yours. You're going to find this book on Kindle, Amazon, and as always on my website, samnickerbacher.com. Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy show. And today I have a good friend. I'm so grateful that I got connected with him and met him at the last mastermind I went to. But Jeremy Heriter has super accomplished so many things. I'm going to let him get into some of his accolades, but I don't want to uh, ruin it. But he's, he's just an incredible leader. He's focused on now more passionate about helping you become your optimal self. Um, he's got a company called The Optimal Self, Art of Becoming the Best Version of Yourself. That's really what this podcast is about, is about how do we help you live a meaningful legacy, build a meaningful legacy. And that starts by living it every day. The way you create a meaningful legacy is to live that meaningful legacy every day. And wouldn't you like to live that legacy as your optimal self and be, be the best version of yourself as you're building your legacy? And I, I just knew as soon as I met Jeremy, uh, and what he was sharing and his life story and what he's promoting that I wanted him on here. I wanted to share him with you guys because uh, everybody says very similar things in different ways. And I was just listening to a podcast with Ed Milet and Matthew McConaughey. And it's ph- phenomenal, phenomenal. But a lot of it is like, wait, that I, I intuitively know is true. They're using different language than I use, different words, but it's something that if you have become any level of successful uh, in your marriage, in your family, in your relationship, in your business, they're, they're principles that you've learned. You may not have even known that you were living them, but when they are told to you in a certain way, you recognize truth. And the important thing about what they said there was, once you recognize that, how do you replicate that? And that's what I think Jeremy has done multiple times in multiple areas of his life is replicated his success. Mm-hmm. And that's why I want him on here to share with you, how can you replicate becoming your optimal self and become the best version of you? So thank you, Jeremy, for, for hopping on, making time. I know you've been traveling a lot. I've been traveling a lot, but I'm glad we were able to nail down a time and, and get this going. So share with the audience who you are, where you came from, all the crap you went through to become who you are. And then, you know, unabashedly share with, share with them your successes so that they know that they can get there too. Yeah. So first off, thank you. Uh, and let me, let me also say right back at you, it, you know, it was a mastermind that we were at, right? So I got to see you in, in action and, and get, and get to experience you as a leader, as a man, as a business owner, um, and truly as an expert in your field. And so I appreciate you and, and, and loved every second of it. I'm, I'm honored to not only be on your show, but, but now to call you my friend. So, uh, right back at you now let's get this straight real quick. Um, the, the art of becoming the best version of you has been built over, you know, well, I'm 52 years old today. So, uh, actually turned 52 last Sunday. Um, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) And, and again, it's, it's been a rocky, crazy, fun, uh, all the, all the, the expletive words, uh, journey. And so, but I want the audience to know this is, is when people, when I come on shows like this or in that, in that environment that we were at, when I get honored to be able to speak in front of just incredible, incredible business owners and people who are aspiring to, to truly, um, change the world in their own, in their own way, right. Is bring, is bring some good to the world is when they introduce you, they say, here's Jeremy. He was an all pack 10 infielder at Gonzaga university. He was, you know, he went on to play for the Cincinnati reds and the Arizona diamondbacks. He went to the CrossFit games. He actually won an event was number one in the world, you know, and you saw that picture and, and, and then went on to, to build multiple companies. The last company did 786 million in volume, like all these crazy accolades. And I start that every time when I hear that is because I hear it and I think, wow, that guy's, that guy's done some shit. Like that guy's pretty badass. And then I realize it's me. Right. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, hold on. And so I stop everybody in those tracks and I want to, and I want everybody that's in the audience now to listen is that 
it's not that guy that you saw up there. We tend to sit back and 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 hearify these people, right? Doesn't matter who it is. You just made reference to Ed Milet and Matthew McConaughey, and we could all sit back. We know who they are, you know. One of them is a billionaire, and I don't know if McConaughey is or not, but you know, he's super famous and done a great, amazing things. And, and everybody loves to hear what he has to say. And he has an incredible message, but we hearify these people in, in a way that, that we think that they have a characteristic, a trait, something that we don't have. And I stop everybody, Sam, cause I'm like, no, that guy you're looking at now, or the guy's voice you're hearing, whether you're listening to this, that's not the case. Matter of fact, most of you listening right now, are smarter, taller, better, fat, like whatever word you want, better for sure. But we do that. And the reason why we do that as humans is because it gives us an out. It keeps us from actually going after our dreams, going after our ultimate goals, going after our optimal self, our optimal life, our optimal family, our uh, everything that you can put there. We take, it takes away because it's like, oh, I could never do that. I could never be that, that person. But the truth is you can in whatever arena or, or thing that you want it to be. And so I want to stop everybody right in their tracks when they listen and to say, no, you, that's not the guy before you. The guy before you grew up with an alcoholic, drug addict father who abused my mom, abused us. My, I had a little brother, I have a little brother as well. And, you know, my mom was 16 when I was born. That's 1971. That wasn't happening. It happens a lot more in today's day and age, not in those days. It was very, very rare. And here she was, right? And so who, she doesn't know what it's like. Most of us don't have kids till we're 20s or 30s and we still don't know. Imagine being when you were 16, right? 15 when she got pregnant. But the one thing she did do is protected us. And she grabbed us out of that environment. And the moment that that he went to a bar one night and was pissed drunk, she said, I'm not going to be home for this anymore. And she literally put us in strollers because we didn't have a car and walked us to a payphone and put her 10 cents in and called my, my, my nan and papa. And they came and picked us up and we never went back. And I say that because, you know, when you see the accolades and, and you hear all these things that this, this human, this other, this person, Jeremy has done, that's not how it started. That's not, that's not what I grew up in. Even we were lower middle class, fought for everything. My mom worked two, three jobs at times to make sure that we had, you know, the things that we needed. She got help from the family people, you know, in the neighborhood, taking me to baseball practices and stuff like that. Cause, cause she had to work, you know, everybody pitched in, it, you know, rate, you know, took a village, so to speak. Right. Um, but I can, you can use that as an excuse or you can use that as an excuse, <laughs> it doesn't matter which way you look at it. It could take you either way down or up. And it was never, and I'll say it this way. It was never a, a, a spite thing. It was never a fuel thing to be like, I'm going to show you kind of thing. It was just, I just loved playing baseball. And when I look back at it, when I got older and I had to do some internal work on my identity and who I was, because I was going through a depression and, and, and things were happening in my life, is that I, what I found was that baseball was an escape for me. It allowed me to get out of those, you know, being home by ourself or, you know, not have getting to the field was amazing. Like I, my mom will tell you, she couldn't stop the car fast enough and the car wouldn't even stop. And I was jumping out of the car to jump over the fence to, to be on that field and, and run around. And so what you learn and I learned in those days was the work outside of the practice and whatnot is where I got better. And, you know, there are other things in, in your life that, that become paradigm shifting moments, if you're paying attention, that take you up or down, right? Things that can, can literally lead you to either a very dark place or could just fuel you to where, to where you, you, feel, you feel fulfilled, right? And that's, and that's the truth, what we're trying to do. Optimal self, as, as time went on for me, 
is what I found was I started coaching people. I started teaching people in real estate. We started, I started owning, operating, running businesses, running, running brokerages with two, three, 400 agents at a time. And when you're dealing with humans at that level, that often, that many different personalities, that many different types of people from different walks of life is that it all came down to the same stuff is, are you being your best self each and every day? Not my version of your best self, not your mom and dad's version of your best self, not your friend's version of, of, of your, but, but actually creating it, identifying it. What are the things that that person does? And then starting to create them because listen, in real estate, because that's my specialty, sales is sales is sales is sales. It doesn't matter. There's there's only certain ways you're going to get business. You've got to be in front of people. You've got to talk to people. You got to know your your industry, your your, your craft, right? You got to know floor plans and you got to know areas, things like that. But everybody teaches that. <laughs> there's no differentiator there, right? Everybody has to know that. But Optimal Self was built because as I was working with all these different people from all these different walks of life, it all came down to the same thing. You're living somebody else's life. You're living somebody else's version. How about we sit down and create your version? How about we sit down and create that? And then what happens, the, the skill, the job becomes some, it becomes who becomes what you can do because I'm being my best self. And guess what happens? People start to resonate with that. People start to go, oh, wow, I really like that girl. I really like that guy. And that's what, t- that's what starts to build. And then when you're in service, meaning you're helping other people, you get fulfilled. I get fulfillment. When somebody texts me and says, hey, I, Jeremy, I did this. Look at what happened. I got this result. My heart is full, man, full. Whether I make a dollar or not, it's not about that. I'm going to tell you, it, it warms my soul. And so I knew early on, now it's been almost close to 15 years since, since this has all been, you know, uh, I've been doing this first undercover, right? And now bringing it out to the world because I just did it with the people that were around me in my own brick and mortar buildings. And now, it, now we're it's time to step out. And I promised uh, a kid a few, uh, probably like five years ago now that I won't go to bed. I won't go to my grave with any of this inside of me that I'm going to share it with the world. Anything that I can do to help somebody, I'm going to do it. And that's where we are today. And that's, that's, that's why I stood on that stage and and got to meet you is because I said, I'm not, I'm going to give this to whoever I can and whoever will listen. Um, and whoever wants to, to use it to their benefit. Let's go. Yeah. And I, I so appreciate that. Something that you mentioned while you were there, uh, just in private, our, our conversation was how normally when you go to events to speak, you're behind the curtain, you, you speak, you get taken out, you speak in front of a bunch of people and then you leave. And how different of an experience that was when you actually came and you, you sat in the audience, you participated. There was a small group. I mean, one of the things about that mastermind specifically that the organizers really push an emphasis on is we don't want more than 50 people there total. Like that's total team. That's total. Everybody who's helping put it on. We mm-hmm. keep it very small and intimate intentionally uh, to make sure that everybody has the ability to build meaningful relationships. And so, yeah, talk about that experience and what, what was unique about that experience in and of itself? hundred percent. Exactly what you said, what I shared with you and, and, and I'll, is that, Normally when I get asked to speak, that's what happens, right? You fly in, um, you're in a green room, you're behind the curtain, you're, you're working with the, the sound people and, and you know, the organizers as well. And maybe you do a little interview or whatever, but you never really, it's a very small piece that you're actually interacting with the, the audience, with, with the people who are there, with the people who actually paid money to have a ticket. Um, and so in this case, not only did I get to, I was a participant. So I got to leave that hat off. I got to leave my speaker leader, business owner hat off for a minute and just go and, and receive and just participate, listen, 
and, and, and learn. And I would write down every day my intention, right? My intention going in is that I'm going to learn something new today. I'm going to take in anything that they're willing to give. I want to absorb. I want to be that sponge. I want to be in that room. And what's really cool is like you said, is those people, the first, the, the first full day for sure, they don't even know that I'm, that I'm there to speak. So I get to know them just two people sitting next to each other in a room or, you know, at lunch or whatever, you know, whatever at the break, when you're standing in line waiting for the restroom, you get to chat it up with that, that guy sitting next to you. And they didn't know, they had no idea. And I didn't share that. I kept that to myself until it was time, until they saw me come from the back and walk down that aisle and people were like, Oh yeah. Oh man, that's the guy. You know what I mean? Like, and I love that about it because Look again, you can hearify people. You can, you can not get to know them from a real, um, internal level because they're like, Oh, that's the guy from the stage or, Oh, that's the guy that was leading X, Y, or Z. And so there's a different lens that they look through at that moment. But in this case, the lens was always like just two people talking. And I mean, there were some incredible people <laughs> in that room, like for real. Like I was like, I was like, you know, fanboy. you know what I mean? I was like, this is incredible. And so I'll say this to that experience. If you ever, I mean, I have never, I've been to, I don't even know, hundreds of these things in my lifetime, right? From all the way back. I mean, remember coming out of baseball, I did. I did these things all the time. I spoke at events and for kids and for high schools and for colleges. And, you know, I did uh, camps where we were helping like all kinds of stuff. And I've never been in, a, in an environment where it was, it was done this way. And like, I, I think I told you there, I was like, man, I just, I, I loved every second of it. Yeah. And I, I think that one of the things I want to highlight here is the mentality because part of what we're talking about is being, becoming your optimal self and not being living not living somebody else's version of yourself. And part of that, it's really fascinating because when people approach you from the version of yourself that is heroified, right? Because they're approaching you from a hero heroified perspective. Uh, I'm curious from your perspective, you've dealt with this more than I have because you've reached higher accolades, public accolades than I have. How do you honor yourself and still be gracious and allow them? Because what I've seen it happen where some people have kind of fan, fan boy or fan girl. And the leader's like, no, they just shut it down. They don't even accept that they have accomplished anything. And so then the other person walks away feeling like, I just like, I feel, vi I feel violated, even though I was trying to recognize how much I appreciate this person as an example and what they've accomplished, they feel violated because the person just was not willing to receive their accolades from that individual. So there's, there's a value of like accepting your laurels or accepting the, the recognition but also graciously letting them know that they can accomplish it too. So how do you balance that in an initial reaction when you've been hero five, you've been, people are coming up to you, treating you in that position, but you yourself would rather um, maybe not be on the same level as them, but at least communicate that it's everything you've accomplished, they could accomplish as well. So how do you balance that from a communication perspective and maybe like a five minute interaction with somebody? I love that question. Thank you. Uh, th thank you for asking that. Cause that's a, this is a very important piece that I think gets glossed over a lot. So I'm going to, there's two sides to what you just said. One side is when somebody comes up and they are, you know, like hearifying, like, oh my gosh, you know, um, yeah, they, they, want they go, oh my gosh, like you're this finisher. and you said that, I can't believe it. How'd you do it? You know, those kind of things. It's like, um, first of all, never, I never, ever, ever stop them from being in their moment. I'm not going to take them out of their moment, whatever that is. Right. And, and I'll be honest with you, Sam, it, it, it does make me uncomfortable. That's an uncomfortable position for me. Right. I don't, because I do believe in everybody. It, I, I say this all the time. I even said this there. I was like, if y'all hang out with me long enough, you're going to believe in yourself. I promise you, because I'm going to show you thing after thing, after thing, after thing of how wonderful you are. And I'm going to keep reminding you and I'm going to keep showing you, Oh, you did this great job. See how good you are. Right. So one, 
never take that moment from them, regardless of what it is. And I'll say this as a person, no matter what in anything, if someone's mad, don't take that away from them. They're angry for a reason. Yep. There's something inside. If you try to, because if I try to push back, it's only coming back worse. Or in that case, I take away the feeling that they have. What I want to do in that moment, Sam, is I want to anchor that feeling for them, but I want to anchor it in a way that is to serve them. Very important. I don't take away their moment. Honor it. I say thank you, first of all. Be gracious to that. I don't go, yeah, thanks, but never. Take it on. Listen to them. And then I want to anchor that feeling with them. You do that one of two ways. Again, you got to be careful here because of today's day and age, but in the anchor position, I might even put my hand on their shoulder, right? Like somewhere that's very safe, especially if it's a situation, you know, male, female situation, something like that. You got to be very careful in, in touching another human being. But if, if that's not possible, what I try to do is ask them a question in, in, in the regard to what they've said to me. First, I great, I graciously say, thank you. That's awesome. Uh, it, and I always tell them it warms my heart to know that, that, that some part of that, what I have of my, of my life, my speech, my, my story resonated with you. That's awesome. And I'll ask them a question about them. So depending on what they said and depending on what it was, how, oh, this did resonate with you. Tell me a time in your life. What's your story? Right. Oh yeah. My mom also did this. I, in that case, there's, there, I can tell you a very specific incident where a lady came up to me right after that. And you know, the story where, you know, when I got told I wasn't good enough at 13 years old and, uh, and I asked my mom to come pick me up, but she did. And she was like, I can't believe they, they did. He told you that. And I was crying and I was upset. I was 13 years old. This, you know, and my, my soul was crushed. And in that moment, I begged with her not to go in there and say anything to this person because I was embarrassed, you know, and I was like, please, mom, let's not make this worse than it is. And in that moment, she looked at me and she said, fine, you don't want me to go in there. You don't want me to go handle this. What are you going to do about it? She gave me the the responsibility that the fact that i wasn't good enough to make that team the fact that someone looked me in the face and told me you're not good enough that it was my responsibility to what goes on next what happens next is on me it's not their fault it's not her fault it's not that i didn't have a dad to play catch with right it's not that the coach didn't like me it's that I hadn't earned the damn right to do it. And in that moment, she gave me that. She gave me the moment of saying, what are you going to do about it? To this day, I have right here on a piece of paper every day. This isn't going right. This isn't good. What are you going to do about it? You're going to sit here and cry? You're going to sit here and blame somebody else? going to blame the economy. You're going to blame this real estate. Oh man, interest rates are up. We're going to blame the fed. We're going to blame this. We're going to blame that. I can't do anything about that. What can I do? So what am I going to do about it? And I say that in, in what you were saying, and I'll say it this way. Cause I, again, in that moment, there was a lady in the audience that day that you were there as well. That came up to me after she had tears in her eyes. And she said, Hey, thank you for, for sharing your story. I had a similar story with my mom. She's like, it really touched me. And I could see that she was obviously visibly upset. And I just put my hand on her hand and I said, tell me about it. She's like, Oh, we don't really have time. And I said, listen, <laughs> we have nothing but time. Tell me about it. And the, her face immediately changed because someone was going to listen to her. And she told me the story and I'll share a story because nobody knows who this is. And I don't, I, you know, uh, but she said in that, in, a, in the same type of moment, hers was, she was very tall as a, as a young girl. And I mean, she's still very tall. <laughs> she was still very tall, but as a young girl, she was very tall, which made you a model in those days, right? If you were this tall and when, and, and when she went on this modeling thing with her mom and her mom was like very adamant about her being a model and you can do, you know, whatever she had done some stuff in the past. And they said, you're, you know, you're 10 pounds overweight. 
And she said, you know, and I weighed like 120 pounds, <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's, you know, it's ridiculous. And, but her mom, when they got in the car said, you know, you've got to lose the weight. You've got to do better. You've got to eat better. You've got to start doing this. You need to start going for runs every day. You need to stop hanging out with this person. Right. She gave her all the, the things which hurt her in a way. Right. She was living with this. Like she was, it was her mom. She felt like she was beating down on her. Not good enough. Not good enough. Not good enough. And so in that moment, Sam, and I'm listening to her and I let her say everything that she had to say. And I asked her, can I ask you a couple questions regarding this? Do you mind if I, I get a little more context with you? And she said, yes, please. And I said, do you think your mom was really doing that to actually hurt you? She said, um, uh, probably not. I said, probably not or, or no. She's right. like, no, no. And I said, okay. I said, let me ask, I said, hold on a second. Do you think that she was actually trying to protect you from ever getting another no or rejection at another modeling gig? She, again, we're not perfect. None of us parents are. <laughs> we all, we all screw it up as humans. We, you know what I mean? Like, but I said, do you think that that was just her capacity at that point? That's all she knew. She didn't know what else to do. Wasn't because she was trying to be mean. It wasn't because she didn't love you. Wasn't because, matter of fact, it's probably because she loves you so much that she was like, you got to go lose this weight so this never happens again. And it's what we do a lot of times as parents, right? Is that we, we, we actually take them away from, from, we tell them, don't do it. No, Jeremy, don't try to be a professional baseball player. Because the chances of you making it are really fucking slim, really slim. And I don't want you to be hurt, right? They want to protect us. But that means if they told me don't do it, which I got told that by everybody, bro, you're never going to make it. You're too small. You're not big enough. You're not strong enough. You're I, all those things I got told. Guess what? So what? So what? That's your opinion. Mm -hmm. And now again, did I make it to the big leagues and spend 20 years and become a hall of famer, which was my dream? No, no. I can tell you this. I learned a heck of a lot about how to fall in love with the process, about how to fall in love with how to do shit when no one's looking, how to do more than anybody else, you know, how to go in and work on my weaknesses. And that, you know, when I couldn't hit a curveball, that I went out and I, wor I worked and worked and worked and worked. And by the next season, man, I, you threw me a curveball and there's a good chance that thing was going in for the gap for a double. You see, you know, my point is this to everybody listening is that in these moments, it's not about the, the, what the person says. It's really how we take it. And when I said that to her in that moment, everything changed for her. Everything. Because it's no longer this person that was hated me, right? Or, or that I was a bad person. It was that, look, sometimes that's just all they know. That's, that's as good as they can be. Again, I, I, I opened this before. I said, look, <laughs> I didn't grow up easy. I grew up in lower middle class. I grew up in, you know, with a, again, Sam, my, my birth father <laughs> almost burned down the house cooking meth and meth in the garage, cooking meth, bro. Like could have killed us all. Almost burned the house completely down. And it took me a lot of years. Don't get me wrong. Cause once I figured out who this man was and what he was doing, I was like, I don't want nothing to do with him. but it was only holding me back. Right. Because the moment that I could actually say is I could actually understand him and, and say, Oh wait, sure. He's, I love him. In, in, in that way, but that's just his capacity. That's as good as he gets. Mm -hmm. That's not his, that's not my fault. And, and I know you're going to say it's his fault. It's, it just is. Right. And I don't, when I had my daughter, Sam, I lost it. I was so, I, I was, I mean, the, the feeling, you know, when your first was born, second was born, whatever, there's a love that you've never felt before. Mm -hmm. I mean, a love and it is like, Holy cow. 
And again, some people get it right away. Some people, it comes as time goes on. It's not, there's no right or wrong to this either. So, so if you're listening and you're like, well, I didn't feel like that. It's like, that's okay. There's no right or wrong. I'm telling you my experience. And I loved her and, and that little voice and that little cry. And, and I mean, (laughs) I can still hear it today and she's 27 years old. My, my point is this, is that when I left there and we got home and we were getting into it and I thought to myself, I don't want to miss a second. How could this man not want to be part of my life? And I went on to, to be a division one, to be an all packed in infielder, to, to get to play professional baseball. And he was never around. He missed it all. Right. And I thought, how could you want to do that? What the hell is wrong with this dude? Right. And so I even got more angry with him later in life than, than, than the stuff that happened, which is a true story. Right. And I had to come to grips with it, man. I did. But I had to come to grips and say, listen, stop trying to, why should I ever impose how he should have been because of how I want to be? That's not fair to him. That's not fair. He, so he doesn't have the same capacity. So he didn't feel the same way. Does that make him wrong? Not to me, it doesn't. And, it, and it, it freed up my own soul. It freed up my own heart to actually say, hey, it's okay. He, you, you did the best that you could. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. And now I'm going to go do the best that I can. And I'm sure my kids are going to be like, hey, you screwed this up and you screwed that up. And I'll be like, man, I was just doing the best I could with the information that I had at the time. <laughs> and hopefully I got a little bit better along the way. Yeah. Hopefully it's better than at least in your mind, what happened before. I think that that's such a, those, those questions. I, I, I how do I say this? Well, I'll just say it. I, I am a deep believer and this is a strange thing. Most people don't get this, but I'm a believer that uh, forgiveness is irrelevant. And the reason it's irrelevant is that when you start to believe that life is just a myriad of experiences, neither good or bad, but that they happened and that you get to choose what you believe about each of these experiences. Then you start to view each of these experiences as gifts rather than trauma, rather than pain, rather than looking at your dad in this conversation as this bad person or whatever, like, Hey, thank you for doing the best that you knew how. Thanks for mm-hmm. even making sure I made it to this planet. You know, like, thank you. The, the moment you switch your mindset about what you believe about this world, then you start becoming grateful for things. And it doesn't make sense to forgive somebody for giving you a gift. It just doesn't make sense anymore. So forgiveness in my mind just doesn't compute because now all I am is grateful for my life experiences. Mm. You can't hurt me if I'm grateful that you showed up fully you just like you were saying hey even if they're mad maybe they're not fangirling but maybe they're they're upset at something you said and they're outraged hey thank you for showing me who you are and also showing me how i showed up in the world that was a gift if nobody came up and got upset at me then i wouldn't know if i was on track or not you know and but that goes both ways maybe i like what you're i i'm glad that i triggered you not because i'm glad that you're experiencing pain but because I found out, no, I am creating separation from the people that I don't want to be around and the people that I do want to be around. That's a, that's a wonderful feedback mechanism, right? So there's all these pros and cons that are experiencing in our lives and I'm grateful for life. So forgiveness doesn't make sense. And that's what you've just described. You got to a point where you went from being angry to, Hey, what's that's the best that they knew how. And then you're able to help coach other people through what if that's the best they knew how? And my questions in my journal, I was sitting through your training and you're going through your eight questions of transformation. And my four questions are basically the same thing. I say, write down the facts without any emotion, then write down how you feel about them, write all your feelings, all the good, the bad, everything you've ever felt about it. And then this is where you start gaslighting yourself or brainwashing yourself or redefining your experience, however you want to say it. You start asking yourself, what could also be true? Where was that person at? What kind of pain could, did that person go through that the only reasonable explanation to life was to act in that manner? What could also be true? And it does, none, of that, none of that section even has to be true. It just like is a way for you to become okay with 
this, these are other circumstances that could have gave, given me understanding of why somebody acted that way. And then why am I grateful and what did I learn from it? And those are all the things that you just described in your process with that, that girl, woman, I'm yep. sure she's a woman because everybody there, I know I was a woman. <laughs> so I, I love that. Thank you for answering that. Now I want to go back even farther to, to some things that, again, you're, you're old. I'm like midway in life, right? So I'm 30 years old. You're 54, you said? 52. 52. Okay, 52. So you grew up before I did in a different era as far as like what childhood looked like. Uh, then I grew up in like the, 90s and early 2000s and now i'm we're both you've already raised most of your children i'm raising my children okay and so this is where this question's coming from the idea that it took a village to raise a child like having that type of experience as a as a parent now trying to raise children in the world that we live in i don't see a lot of village behavior like that of coming together and getting a tribe of people who are all equally invested in raising children with the same morals and values and an outcome, right? So back then, I'm going to say back then, because I feel like this happened a lot with when I was growing up, even there was still this mentality that the neighborhood parents could discipline the neighborhood children. You know, they could educate, they could say, that's not allowed. This is allowed. But now I don't feel like that's the case as much. So how do you, your insights, how do you go about raising your children and getting around other people with similar morals and values that you feel comfortable saying, Hey, you can go learn from this other person. Um, so they can help share in the parenting. Cause for some reason we all think our parents are idiots around like 12 years old to 24. We're like, yeah, whatever, no interest. So how do you create that village type mentality around a certain group of people that you could trust your children with man we'd be billionaires if i could we if we could bottle that i know, I know there's no right answer but i just want to know what your thoughts are <laughs> yeah i know i know i'm just uh, <laughs> i love again that's why i love you man the, the the questions and the depth of your uh the depth of who you are as a human like in search of the better ways and in a better life for not just your children but the future generations is 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 incredible so i love it um the only thing i can say to any of that is making sure it it, it starts with me that's what i'm going to tell you it starts with how i show up in the world and being in a position, putting myself in a position, um, again, you're, you're, you are a product of your environment, no matter what it is. And some people that are listening to this have a better way to, to choose their environment than, than others. That just is the way it is. Some of its economic standards and things like that and, and what we've done. Um, but I'll tell you, I mean, we have an eight year old at home now and you know, it's by design, where he goes to school, you know, the, the, the people that he's around, right. That is, is for, it is by design. We choose it. We make sure. So again, his, his hopes, dreams, ambition at this young age, right. I mean, it changes. He's seasonal, you know, when it's baseball, man, you can't get him off a of baseball. When it's basketball, you can't get him off a of basketball court. When it's football, all he wants to do is run, you know, it's so it's seasonal in that, in that way. And I say that it doesn't matter if you're, if your son or daughter picks a different sport or picks a different, you know, music or whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's one putting them in the best position to succeed at that thing as often as possible. Our, our job now is to, is not to just provide it's to put them, put him, put us in environments. Same reason I chose the environment that I met you at. That was a choice. I did my, I did my research. I talked to one, two, three, four different people before I made the decision. And I mean, because it's time out of my day, it's time away from, from, you know, the, uh, our son It's time away from, you know, everything, my business. And if I'm going to choose that, then I need to make sure that I'm making the, a quality decision 
around what I want for my life. And so it, it goes back to, to saying to myself, if I'm creating this village and I, and I'm, you know, want this opportunity, well, first and foremost, I have to be there. I have to create, I have to live it. So I have to, I would say, how do I do it? I make a list, just like you talked about. What, what are the things, if I was building a village of people that I would want, that I would be okay with telling Michael what to do, what are those things that I would want those people to be like? And now, guess what happens? Now, my reticular activating system starts to look for those things in the people around where we should be, the things that we do. Same thing goes right now, right? We've graduated from different elements of sport. And what's happening, Sam, which is really interesting, is probably four or five of those kids that we started with early, say we had 12 or 15 of them. Let me see, one, two, three, four of them for sure, including mine. So five have now played baseball, basketball, and football together. The same four other kids have been on all of our teams in these different, in, in these different other seasons. Uh -huh. And I, and if you ask me why it's not just because of the, the children, but it's also because of the parents, because we're looking for parents that are X, Y, Z, B, and C. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. You start, you start to be the one. It's not anybody else the, I didn't know any of these people prior. But I know them when they show up because I have already made my reticular activating system look for those traits, look for those things. And, and the same thing goes. I can say, and if any of these people that listen are business owners, it's the same thing, right? Who do I want to work with? Who is that ideal client? It's the same thing. I make a list of the things that create the I that are the ideal client. How do I want them to act? Well, in, in, in our world, I want them to be decisive. <laughs> I want them, I want them to, you know, be, know what they want. I want them to, to walk the walk, you know, like you could go down the list of all the things. And so what's really interesting is you, you, once you know what that is, those things start to show up. The reason why it doesn't show up for people or the reason why they keep slipping back is because somebody else is determining your environment you're not the one and when you start to be the one guess what they start to show up those elements start to come to fruition and and more more important than anything sam is you are aware so when it does show up you know it same opportunity is the same way i talk about this a lot with with my people you know you most of us miss the opportunity because we didn't know it was an opportunity mm -hmm. because we weren't we weren't ready to receive it because we hadn't designed and, and looked for, Hey, this is what I'm looking for. Right. It may not show up tomorrow. It might be two or three years down the road, but all of a sudden it shows up and you're like, wow, that's exactly what I want. Okay, good. Cause of the awareness is there. Right. And so, so to, that's really funny when I watched the secret and read the, um, What's that book called? Think and grow rich. Right. So when you, you learn about the law of attraction and how that works, I, it gets, in my opinion, so mislabeled by people who are manifestor coaches or whatever. It's like, look, the reason the law of attraction works is not that, not entirely that you become in alignment and stuff starts magnetizing to you. Although there's elements of that. I'm not going to, again, I studied enough neuroscience that I understand that the elements there yeah. in the spiritual level, but a lot of it comes down to, are you programmed to recognize and are you attracted to the right thing. And this goes into relationships. It's not if your wife or your spouse uh, be, loses attraction or, or gains attraction. It's did you program your mind to be attracted to your spouse or did you program your mind to start be attracted to anything else that walks around? Right. That, that's a I mean, huge relationship thing. People are programming themselves to not be attracted. Now, my wife says, hey, do you really think I'm cute? Do you really think I'm pretty? You always tell me. I'm like, yeah. You are. You're the hottest thing ever. Right. Why? Well, because at this point I programmed myself to believe that. And whether somebody else believes that or not, as far as I'm concerned, there's nobody cuter than my wife. So like, <laughs> there, there's a lot of attractive people out there. I'm not saying that there's no attractive people out there, 
but like my life is for me and not for anybody else and nobody else is for me. And so understanding that this is, this is going to the other thing. We're going to run out of time here, which is, it's okay. It's okay. This is what I love about meeting uh, cool people is that you could talk for hours, but something that I noticed at this mastermind, there's a lot of people. I mean, I say a lot, there was maybe 30 people that were there as guests and there was total 50 people. But what I found fascinating that oftentimes I think the imposter syndrome person, uh, maybe not the imposter syndrome, I think they're both imposter syndrome. The person who's saying I can't because, and they're excusing themselves from success. That's a level of imposter syndrome, just as much as a person who's experiencing success and feels like they shouldn't be there. It's the same person, right? The one person feels like they can't get there because of all their excuses. And the other person feels like they shouldn't be there because of all their deeper trauma. But what I noticed of the people who came through there, the people who took the most notes, the people who are most active in one, recognizing what they were looking for, but also taking what they were looking for, putting it into immediate application, and also taking that most information from that experience, were the most successful people in the room financially, from a relationship perspective, from a happiness perspective, their joy level was way higher. I mean, there was people there who were just getting through their, their crap, you know, and you can make money and still be going through your crap. You can be a division one baseball player and still be having a lot of crap to go through. So money's not an indicator of how much crap you have in your life, unfortunately. (laughs) Um, But what I noticed was that you guys were taking the most notes out of anybody else in the room. Talk about where you learned that and why it's so important to be, and this is another thing, right? They weren't taking notes on their phones. They weren't typing out notes on their computer. They were all handwriting their notes. So talk about kind of the, why that, why do you find that that's the case? The most successful people take the most notes and also why are you writing it down rather than typing it out? Hmm. Well, um, I'm, I'm only going to speak for myself and I know that I learn better, um, when I physically write it on a page where my eyes are seeing it and my hand is moving in a writing fashion. Um, I know that to be true for myself. Now, the reason I do that, one of my, one of my pillars every day in my morning is to remind myself to learn something new today. One of my, one of my closing, I call them evening insights with our, with our clients is that one of the evening insights, the question is, what did you learn today? My goal every single day is to learn something, something new, something that I didn't, or, you know, and sometimes Sam is just hearing, I might already have heard it but I'm reminded of it or hear it in a different way. And I can take that as a learning. Cause I, I, cause again, you heard me say this before. I already know that the worst four words you can ever say to yourself, especially in business or especially as you get older, right. Is because it stops you from learning because you're like, Oh, I already know that. Yeah. 99% of the shit you're about to hear ever has already been said. Right. (laughs) Like every book that is out today has already been written 20 times. If you go back and you actually look at now, it might be my version, but you know, I might say it differently, but there are pull up, whatever, pull up business books, pull up self-help books, pull up hell, pull up hitting a baseball books on Amazon. There's a bajillion of them, right? Like my point is this, is that my goal and the reason to, an- to answer your question, the reason why I write it is for the simple fact is that uh, that's how my brain works. I can see it even right now to, to, cause you were saying that. And even right now I can, in my mind, visualize, and I can see different pages in that book that I was writing that I remind myself that I've already gone back right now. And I've already implemented mm-hmm. three of the things I learned there, which was just what last week yeah. I've already implemented in my business. It's already running. My VA is already using two of them as the same. Actually, I didn't even leave Vegas. I hadn't even left Vegas. I was in, Sam, this will tell you. And all y'all better, if you want, if you want the-, the, this, the, this, the You're not unique in this. The most successful people there were doing it immediate. And then immediate. there's people who took notes and they were going to do it when they get home or in a month or in three months or whatever. And that's where I'm like, 
I want people to understand the difference because there's people listening to this podcast that are going to, oh, I'm going to remember and I'm going to implement that. No, if you made it to the end of this podcast, you already missed half the information. I don't know if this will all be on, on verge, but if, if this is yeah. video, I'm going to show this. You see the motive, Patrick Lincioni? Yeah. I was standing in the kitchen, getting coffee at the event, getting ready to go to one of my breakouts. And a gentleman in there recommended the book. I bought the book on Amazon, standing in the kitchen with him. When I showed up to my house, it was there. It was already there. I didn't wait to get home to do it. The same thing goes. Two things that somebody gave me in there that I got tips on something. I was sitting in the airport same day, heading back home from the event, sending out to Slack channeling my, my VA, hey, get this and get this, implement it this way. And by the time I left on an airplane and flew home, got in my car and got to my house, it was already done. Why the hell am I gonna wait until I get home? Because by the time I get home, I'll, pro I'll be honest with you, I probably forgot. And I, I might catch it a few days later when I go and I start to, because I have some debriefing stuff that I do, you know, sure. that I do with my clients so that we make sure that we're up to. So, I mean, let me go back to your, the, the, the reason why taking notes that way and being there, the, the, the simple fact is when I said to you, learn something new today, right? In that case where I was, Sam, with you, was each person that walked up there, which in some cases there were like back to back to back, like 35 minutes. So for about an hour and a half, think of it this way. This is how my brain, this is how my mind would work. Each one of those is a new day. So when you spoke, that was a new day. I sat there and I took it blank slate, not thinking about the last guy, not thinking about anything else. I'm just going to listen to him. He's talking about finances and different things and vehicle. And so I'm just going to listen. I'm going to focus. And then when you were done and we got up and we had a little break before the next person came on, grabbed some water, I reset blank page and it's day two. I might have six days that day, but if I, I, and I'm, and I'm sitting down for a simple thing is give me one, mm -hmm. give me one nugget today. Give me one note. And when I say today, each one of those speakers was a day. And even if, even if that person spoke and like I said, some of the stuff you've heard it in different ways or, or whatever, you're looking for that one thing that hits, that, that gets me. And so, yeah, you're right. I have pages and pages and I have, I have book of, I have black, these are all blank, but you see how they have little, they have little uh, tabs on them. I buy these tabs because when I put something down, I tab it and then that's what gets there. So now when I get to it, I just, I know right where to go. And that's how, and that's how my brain knows how that's going. I've already taken the notes from that event and put it where they need to be. So now when I'm thinking about, I just wrote a script the other day. Um, if you remember the gentleman, uh, Devin, the guy yeah. from elite events, yeah. He gave, he gave a framework. Yep. So I took that framework and I put it down. I wrote a script for, uh, for a video that'll be coming out in, in a couple of days. And I used his framework mm -hmm. and I have that framework now to use over and over and over and over again. Like, I mean, I think every, anyone listening right now is, is don't overwhelm yourself with a million different things. Don't, I do this all the time. This, this is my key to success. I don't read, you see people talk about like they read 52 books a year, right? They read like, a, you know, whatever, a book a week, a book a month, a book of this. I don't do that. I don't. I, if I find a book that actually had some great content that, I, that I'm taking something from, it takes me a while to get through a book right. because I'll read the same chapter 12 times. I mean, maybe it's just because I'm that dumb that it just takes that long for it to sink through my thick ass skull. No, I don't think you're that dumb. I think you understand how to uh, milk, not, not milk it, but like be receptive enough to it. I, when I was knocking doors, doing door to door sales, there was the, ag the agents, there was the reps who would go through and they would knock it. They'd maybe talk to 20% of the people, get two or three sales. I'm like, okay, hey, I need a new area. 
And the people who are the best sales, the top sales reps, they wouldn't leave until they either got a yes or a no from every person in that area. And those people would go into the same area after somebody else has already been through it, knocked and sold, whatever, they'll go through and they'll clean up another 10, 12 sales. It's like, you stopped because, I mean, you, you didn't win because you stopped. You didn't win because you were okay with just okay. And the people who are okay with just okay, it's going to be a long, hard road because life is ne- it's always just going to be okay unless you decide to make it great. Your legacy is just going to be lit unless you decide to actually be intentional about how you want to be remembered. You're going to be remembered one way or another. The question is how, and if you're not intentional about it, then somebody else is dictating that. That's right. We are out of time. I'm so sorry. Dang it. Uh, not, not sorry. It's been phenomenal, but keep going. <laughs> I, know. I, have so, I have another appointment that four minutes late for, but uh, here, here's the deal. I want to, I want to know how could, if somebody wants to work with you, Jeremy, because yeah. what I like about what you've done is you've, you've, branched out from just your real estate and said, hey, let's teach these success principles, these ways of being to everybody. So everybody has access to the ways of being. So if somebody wanted to work with you, where would they go? How would they get in touch with you? Uh, so tell us your websites, your socials, whatever, best place to get in touch with you. Uh, two ways. Go to, uh, on Instagram, uh, my my personal handle is baseball, B A S E B R A W L, or just put in Jeremy Herriter. I'm the only one. So it pops up. Uh, in my, there's a link in my bio that will give you uh, that you just click on. It has like three questions. It comes right to me. I look at every one of them. <laughs> so, it, you know, it gets taxing, but I, I, I promised myself that I would do that. So they can go there and, and uh, fill that out. It comes directly to me. And I'm the person that will be responding. So that's that's the easiest way. If they go to if they go to optimalself.us, optimalself.us, they can get the same form immediately right from here. And uh, yeah, just fill it out and and I'll be in touch. Okay. So final question. And guys, yeah. please go do that and just find out what he is. I I, I recommend this with everybody because I I think we've both been on this where you get a bunch of people reaching out and they're asking questions, stuff that you've answered like a thousand times. Consume his content. Search him on 100%. podcasts. Go listen to all of his podcasts. We talked to a little bit about one specific area. He has so much more to offer than what we talked about today. And he offered a lot today, but he has so much more. So go listen to multiple of his podcasts. Spend some time thinking about what he's saying. Take some action on his stuff. So by the time you do reach out, you're like, hey, Thank you for this nugget I got out of this episode on this thing. This uh, implemented it. I can see that you are somebody who I want to learn from. Then you can engage in a relationship. But if you don't value the stuff that he's giving you for free that he's already putting out, as a, as a coach, as a mentor, as somebody who wants to help people myself, it's just like, eh, if I've given you so much. And if you can't get on a podcast and listen to a podcast, like how are you ever going to complete anything else I challenge you to do? <laughs> I, I don't know. So just be intentional. Reach out to him. but reach out with purpose, reach out with intention to become your optimal self. Not just like, Oh, you said to reach out. I'm going to reach out. No, give him some real truth. But final question here, if we were talking six generations from now, so now you're great, 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 great grandchildren. They're sitting around a table discussing your life, the impact you had, the impact you and your wife had, what do you want them to be saying about Jeremy's life that long ago, <laughs> or that far in the future, not long ago, but um, the, so the, it, it's very simple for me. I don't want to leave. I mean, yes, the legacy of, of, you know, you hear people talk about generational wealth. Yeah. The kids are going to get some apartment buildings and some other things that we've built along the way. But the most important thing is I want to build generational habits. So that sixth generation, I hope that they understand that hydration is, is very important. The first thing that you should put in your body every single morning is, is water. You should breathe in some way, shape, or form every day, whether you're a meditator or whether whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter if it's guided or whatever, but you should get some diaphragmatic breathing, meaning into your belly every single day, not sometimes, not anytime. And you should move, meaning you should walk. I mean, if you're into working out, great. If you want vigorous exercise, great. It doesn't really matter to me, but those are the three elements. Well, and, and I'll say that the bonus fourth is regulating your sleep. If you are not, if you are not getting the proper amount of sleep, if you're not getting it, because you remember this, you cannot, when you're burned out it, or even working out, if you over, you cannot overtrain. 
you're only under recovering. It means your that means your water intake is not there and your sleep pattern is not there. That's that's the truth. You cannot overtrain. Most human beings cannot overtrain. You simply under recover. So the sixth generation, they better they better know that great 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 grandpa Jeremy <laughs> made everybody. In there, even if you're with me, if you were at my house right now, Sam, when we get up, I will have your hydration cocktail, which is 22 ounces of water, a half a lemon squeezed in it, and a pinch of Himalayan sea salt every single day. And whoever's in my house, theirs is up and ready. It doesn't matter if it's Michael, who's eight, or Liz, who's 36. Like everybody drink, everybody does it every single day. So look. It's the basics. And here's all I'll say to that. Cause I know people are like, want some like crazy thing. What are they going to say about me? That I was a great guy that I was, this it was like, no, he left habits that have been generational and that everybody is healthy and active because of it. Yeah. I, I think that's awesome. And I was not expecting that. So I appreciate that you, uh, you shared that. I agree. Those things are, are absolutely crucial and they're not always the easiest for me, at least sleep regulation is not the, it's not something I'm super successful with as far as like consistency. Is it, is it cause you have little kids or is it just because you don't focus uh, on it? It's just lack of focus. Like I still get eight, eight or so hours of sleep, but it's not like I train my body the same time every night is going to bed. Every night is waking up. Like I haven't been intentional with that. I have not. Let me tell you this, no matter what the day is, no matter what, let me tell you this, Sam, and I, and I'll give this to your listeners as well. I work on this with my clients. I haven't, I haven't had an alarm in over two and a half years. doesn't matter what the thing is. doesn't matter the day. And I'll tell you why I program my mind every single night to what time I want to wake up. And I tell it, I tell myself why I want to wake up at that time. I am within minutes of the time that I write down. Every night when I go to bed, I write down a time. I'm going to wake up at 632, 634, 628, 6, 615. And I tell my body and my mind, and the reason is, and I write down that reason. Sometimes it's simple just to set the world on fire. It's my job to get up at that time to set the world on fire. Sometimes I got a very specific, I have to get my workout in because I have a meeting at eight and I have a podcast with Sam at 12 and I have this, at, you know what I mean? Like, so right. I prepare my mind to say, and every time, bro, every time my body does it. That's awesome. You can do it. I can do it. I can do it. No, I, I appreciate that. And that's something I can implement easily from this. So thank you so much. And guys, just reach out to them. Phenomenal, phenomenal uh, information here. Okay. And we'll catch you guys next time on the Fuel Your Legacy Show. Thanks for joining us. If what you heard today resonates with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me. And if you do give me a shout out, I'll give you a shout out on the next episode. Thanks to all of those who've left a review. It helps spread the message of what it takes to build a legacy that lasts. And we'll catch you next time on Fuel Your Legacy. Your Legacy.